Good afternoon and good morning to those of you on the West Coast. Thank you for joining us for today's Financial Security Access to Capital for Small Business During Coronavirus, um, a joint production of Small Business Roundtable and our partners at PayPal. My name is John Stanford. I'm co-executive director alongside Rhett Buttle um, of Small Business Roundtable. We're so thrilled. Uh, we'll give um, attendees another minute or so to, to join and then we'll kick off today's program. Um, in addition to Small Business Roundtable and PayPal, we're thrilled to have some real luminaries from the small business community, as well as a small business owner to share experiences around capital access. Um, so we'll continue to welcoming people um, over the next 30 seconds or so uh, before we launch in. And I'll probably say this a couple times, um, but please mute your lines um, uh, for speakers and to avoid feedback. Uh, we will also um, uh, try to mute lines as folks um, if, if there's additional noise. Um, and seeing, uh, seeing attendance start to tick up, I think we'll go ahead and get started so that we can have a really robust conversation today uh, about um, financial security and the role of uh, PayPal um, and Small Business Roundtable and the conversation today. Um, so thank you for joining today. Um, this is the first of four um, uh, exciting opportunities between Small Business Roundtable and PayPal to look at all sorts of aspects of small business ownership and impact during the coronavirus pandemic. Um, we're truly grateful to our partners at PayPal who have worked with Small Business Roundtable. So there are uh, four of, of these webinars. This is the first, and so we do encourage you to, to join all of them. Uh, after our, our panelists speak and share some of their experiences, um, we'll be glad to um, have robust Q&A. Um, so please use the questions function uh, in the GoToWebinar control panel for listeners uh, to ask your questions, and we'll be moderating these um, following uh, uh, initial discussion about capital access and financial security. Again, um, we are muting as many lines as we can but we really ask that you also mute your own line um, in order to maximize quality of the presentation. Um, finally, um, I wanna share that today's conversation is really a focus on small businesses, what they need, what they're experiencing, um, and really an opportunity for an important conversation, not just in the short term and today, but over the next several months, things that policymakers need to know, things that small business owners need to know. Um, and so we won't focus on the technical aspects of things like PPP loans or EIDL loans um, or other federal government programs. Um, our own uh, speakers um, have a robust set of webinars and recorded content on those issues, um, as does Small Business Roundtable and as does PayPal. So um, I know many of you will have questions about those things around things like PPP loan forgiveness. Um, but we'll really be focusing on small businesses um, at a little bit higher level. Um, and so we'll focus on those questions that really um, move the conversation forward. Uh, so I wanna preview that. Um, and with that, it, it's my absolute pleasure to turn um, over for some opening remarks uh, to Paul Dissel Cohen. Uh, he's the Senior Government Relations Associate for PayPal here in Washington, DC. Um, he is a longtime friend of Small Business Roundtable um, and a lead advocate for small businesses in his own right. So with that, Paul, I'd like to um, turn it over to you for some welcoming remarks. Great, yeah, thank you, John. And um, thank you really to Small Business Roundtable for helping us organize uh, you know, the, this series of webinars, um, including the one today that, that are really designed to um, provide uh, some advice and resources for small businesses that are trying to navigate this crisis. Um, for PayPal, small business is really a part of our, our DNA. We see it as a responsibility and a key pillar of our business to not only support small businesses, but really expand opportunity to the underserved entrepreneurs um, as part of our larger mission of financial inclusion. Small businesses are, are obviously facing an unprecedented crisis at the moment. and uh, as a pivotal part of the health of the overall economy, it's it's just really important that we all come together to support entrepreneurs 
both in the immediate, but also in the long-term recovery. Uh, for PayPal financing um, has, for financing for small businesses has been a, a key part of um, our offerings for small business in the last couple of years. We know that um, financing is a top issue for small businesses. Um, and at PayPal, we really want to be an alternative um, option for financing to help really close the gap in access to capital for small businesses that really continue to struggle and, and face those barriers. With our PayPal Working Capital and PayPal Business Loan products, uh, in the last year, we've become a top five lender in the US. Uh, and we're really seeing that our loans are over indexing to those areas of the country that see the largest gap in small business lending and to populations of small businesses that uh, continue to struggle to access financing. Uh, we have also been working uh, with the SBA to facilitate uh, paycheck protection program loans uh, in recent weeks. And to date, we've funded over $1.6 billion in loans uh, to tens of thousands of small businesses all over the country. And as with our other products, we're really seeing these go to the smallest businesses that really need them. Um, our average loan size is around 31,000, uh, which is about half uh, of the average that SBA is reporting out for the program overall. But you know, we know that that this crisis is not going to subside anytime soon. And um, you know, long after the Paycheck Protection Program um, is uh, is depleted, um, small businesses are going to be looking for you know, ways to come out of this crisis and, and come out of a struggling economy. Um, so at PayPal, we're actively looking at how we can work with public and private sector to really create the right system for small businesses um, going forward and, and getting um, our, our long-term recovery plan in place. Uh, you know, we, we obviously don't have all the answers and I think that that's why it's important to organize uh, events um, and webinars like this, where we can hear directly from entrepreneurs and hear from the experts um, and figure out exactly what resources are needed um, from both uh, the government, but also from private sector companies like PayPal. Um, so again, just really proud to be able to serve small businesses, uh, proud to be able to partner with Small Business Roundtable on events like these. Uh, and really looking forward to uh, the event today. Um, so with that, I'll hand it back to John. Thanks so much, Paul. And, and thank you to what PayPal has been doing um, just to support uh, small businesses. I think that billion dollar plus number is incredible. And as we've been hearing and we'll hear today, um, it, it is touching a unique segment. And I think you've leveraged some of your technology in an incredible way to bring uh, this financial tool um, to, to a much needed small business population. So with that, um, I'd like to welcome uh, our panelists uh, to the stage. Um, we have an incredible uh, group of people um, and their heads will slowly pop up on our, our computers, but I'm, I'm just really excited about this. I, I know everyone has been doing lots of webinars and Zooms and all sorts of uh, virtual get togethers. And I really look forward to this is a group of folks um, who I've had the pleasure of knowing for, for a long time. Um, and, and we've done many in-person panels. Um, and, and so I look forward to a really robust conversation. Um, and so we have uh, Karen Kerrigan, President and CEO of Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council. Uh, Todd, um, President and CEO of the National Small Business Association. Uh, Mark, uh, who does incredible work uh, in uh, the Latinx community as CEO of Latino Business Action Network. Um, and, uh, you know, most critically, getting the small business experience from Suzanne, who owns Real Dance Studio. Um, and I think between the, the four of you, uh, I look forward to uh, a, a really in-depth conversation. And uh, Todd, I, I'd just like to start with you over at, at NSBA. Um, as the oldest small business organization in the country, this is not the first crisis uh, your membership has faced. But how is this one different? Um, are there lessons learned from previous challenges? Um, uh, and how, how is your membership doing as it relates to capital access? Yeah, well, not our first rodeo, as you say. I can't say that I 
have firsthand knowledge, but our organization was founded because of the depression uh, and the need for small businesses to come together during those really trying economic times. So, uh, so yeah, we've been through a series of these since then. The ones that I have firsthand knowledge of really start with the credit crunch of the early 90s, which was a, 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 just what it sounds like, a credit crunch-driven recession uh, that impacted small companies first and, and most. Um, and uh, But most of the events that we've seen in the last 30 years or so that have not been just garden variety recessions have been been driven by some event much like this. So it's been 9/11. It's been the uh, it's been the financial crisis of 2008 2009. Um, but what's unique about this time is that you could see the parameters of those things as they unfolded. You could you know 9/11 happened and then aside from security we were largely back in business within a few weeks. Um, but uh, and there was an economic hit, but you could sort of see the landscape around you. What's different this time is small business owners are having a really hard time seeing, never mind six months or a year out, they're having a hard time seeing six weeks or eight weeks out. And that just really changes your your decision making as a business owner, your ability to make good decisions, feel confident about your decisions, and therefore feel confident about your business. So that's what's really unique. It's really hard to to learn some of those lessons from the past this time. I think it will morph into a more uh, a recession that's driven by potentially by by a restriction on credit to small companies, and we'll be able to learn some of those lessons we learned in the previous credit crunches for how to fix that, how to get through that. Um, but but really, this is a really unique time uh, in our history. I think. Um, but in terms of our members overall, you know, they've they've uh, while they're more pessimistic than I've ever seen them in terms of our surveys, in terms of their confidence in their business, and their knowing what's going to happen, which leads to what I just described. Uh, they are still really resilient people, and that's what that's the, sort of the nature of, of small business people. So, all in all, given the situation, I think they're doing surprisingly well but enormously frustrated as they work through some of these government programs and getting their questions answered, understanding the programs. On the one hand, they're, I think, enormously grateful that that programs like IDLE and PPP have come along to give them this, this um, uh, helping hand. Uh, but at the same time, if their questions aren't answered, it's enormously frustrating because there's just one more unknown in their, uh, in their future. So, um, that's kind of the overview that I would present to what's going on out there right now. And I, I do think, as I said before, that the capital and credit is going to be, uh, I think, an ongoing concern. I mean, the first few weeks of this, it's been about keeping businesses together, keeping them alive through the extension of some of this credit and, and grant-like programs. Um, but going ahead, it's going to be not about how do they stay alive, but how do they grow, how do they take advantage of opportunities at a time when they may not have access to credit. Uh, their credit scores will probably be lowered because of all of this. Their cash on hand will be down because of all of this. And how do we give them the tools they need to, to advance their companies? I think you touched on a, a lot of things there, and it's a good segue over to uh, Karen uh, at SBE Council. Um, you know, from your membership's perspective and, and all the time that you spend as an advocate and engaging members of Congress, uh, what are some of the most significant difficulties um, the small businesses you've talked to have faced during this crisis? And how has the, the CARES Act, which a, a lot of us have talked about, included PPP, things like that, how has that addressed or in some cases not addressed those difficulties? Well, you know, as as Todd mentioned, you know, capital, uh, money, I mean, that's that's a critical issue, both, you know, demand um, and, and cash, you know, capital. So, um, you know, right now I would say they're happy to see that, um, you know, there are, there is reopening, um, happening, uh, throughout the country. So, um, depending on what state they're in, of course, because there are different phases, different ways that, you know, states are doing this, but for those that are in the states where there's reopenings phases, a path forward, I would say there is, there is a little bit uh, more optimism, although they know it's going to be a tough slog. I mean, there's been a pretty big hole that they're going to have to get out of because who knows, you know, what type of recovery we're going to have. And I think they are anticipating it will be, you know, pretty weak uh, for uh, some time to come. So, 
Um, you know, obviously, as, as Todd said, this was just unprecedented, you know, in terms of the hit and just the, you know, the shutdown orders, the stay at home orders, you know, the, the massive drop in revenues um, was something that, it, well, businesses, many of them didn't have control over. And, you know, John, I think about the, the small business roundtable survey uh, that we released on Monday, the Facebook survey that found that 30 some odd, I think 31% of businesses were not currently opened right now because they could not open. These are, and then when you talk about personal care service businesses, that number jumps to over 50%. Um, and the single biggest thing they said that would help their businesses, I think 57% said, you know, the thing that would help their businesses the best is if the government allowed them to sort of open, drive revenues and get back to business. So, um, you know, where we were, I think, you know, with the CARES Act, you know, the government's response, the PPP, you know, I, I have to say, um, you know, at that point in time that all of this was coming to together and they were developing PPP and some of these other programs, um, many of the members, I think many Americans, um, didn't think that the crisis would go long, as long as it has. Um, and then, of course, there was the cascade, cascading effects from the shutdown, you know, how long some states, you know, uh, how some of their shutdown orders were lasting to. In Virginia, it was June 10th, although that, that has somewhat been, you know, relieved and lifted. Um, so, you know, if PPP and the CARES Act, um, if, if it was very that, that very short period, you know, that eight weeks, that, you know, everything would be great after eight weeks again, um, you know, then maybe that would have been a a program uh, that would have been, uh, you know, worked and more effective for many uh, small businesses. But there were several problems. I won't go into them in detail. As you know, a lot of small businesses had problems accessing, you know, those loans. Um, thankfully, fintech came along. Um, you know, the PayPal's, you know, of the world, and and it and it's really shown that being a part, um, you know, you know, of the whole PPP program has really reached the type of businesses that need the money the most, the, the small businesses, not a lot of money as we've seen in the average of all the FinTechs. I think it's just over $20,000 based on the last SBA report. But that being said, you know, as, as time went on and as sort of new rules came out from the SBA, the 75-25 rule, right? The, you know, the, the cap that was placed on um, uh, non-payroll costs in terms of what be, would be forgivable the eight week window in terms of when you got the money, the shot clock begins when you have to use it, you know, to be forgiven. The June 30th covered period that's quickly approaching now. As we're getting, as time went on, you know, the program became less um, uh, practical, less effective, you know, for many of the businesses. And a lot of people, businesses just said, I'm just not even gonna apply for it, particularly with that 7525 rule. So. You know, the good news is, John, I think we're going to see movement on that, right? There's a House vote uh, next week, um, you know, which is good. Um, it, who knows? Is there going to be a vote today, John, in the Senate? Has anyone got the latest news on that yet? You know, it, it, there was like this tweet that came out. Um, any any latest update on that, John? Have you heard anything? No, no crystal ball. I haven't seen it go through the hotline okay. yet, but, but who knows what we'll hear in the course of this webinar itself. There you go. It always happens during webinars or at at seven o'clock on Fridays. That's when the guidance comes out. So we'll, anyway, <laughs> we'll wait for Memorial Day for for more to come out and and interrupt everyone's weekends. And and Karen, I think you're you really put your finger on it of some of the cons you know initially no one knew how long this was going to be and at eight weeks went by very quickly um, for for so many business owners and and here we are and. Talking about some unique challenges, I want to tag in uh, Mark Madrid over at the Latino Business Action Network. Mark, what are some unique challenges faced by Latino entrepreneurs during this crisis, and um, where where do you feel Elban has been on on in terms of positioning on capital access in this very strange and unique moment? Well, thank you for the question, John. Uh, it's nice to be with everyone, and uh, first and foremost to all the entrepreneurs that are on the call. Thank you for your true grit. Uh, in Spanish, we call it ganas. And I thank Paul and the Rhett and John for having Suzanne here representing the entrepreneurs. So Suzanne, excited to hear you. Uh, this, is, this is a tough time. It's been one long day since March. And so we have the highest degree 
of mobilization of scaled Latinx firms in US history. We have uh, 584 uh, Latinx entrepreneurs, scaled entrepreneurs that have gone through our program at Stanford Graduate School of Business. So we had to learn really quickly to be elephants and not hippos. In other words, to be active listeners to our uh, entrepreneurs. And so right now what's happening is we have to realize at the beginning, at the end of the day, the PPP and IDLE are not loss of revenue loans. So we feel an impact with you entrepreneurs. That's just one aspect of your ongoing operations. So what we're doing now is really segmenting our constituency of Latinx business owners so that we can tailor our messaging and programming when it relates to capital access to those that are still A, struggling with PPP access and idle access. Number two, what do we do now? In terms of we get mixed messaging on PPP forgiveness. You know, there is, uh, you know, upcoming easing of restrictions supposedly. So where do we go to find the most timely, accurate and objective information? And then there's a third segment that for whatever reason, they are ready to move forward into the radical reimagination of their business and have a new lens of opportunity when it comes to capital access. You know, our community of Latino and Latina business owners across 50 states in Puerto Rico, dead last in terms of access to capital, dead last. We did a recent SNAP poll and 50% of the respondents of these Latino and Latina entrepreneurs said, now we're interested in capital. That's been the highest percentage that we've ever seen. And so we are pushing the envelope. You know, I served on a panel last year at PayPal headquarters, and we were talking about innovation, pushing the envelope, getting FinTech more involved. And so um, we were delighted to see the PayPal working capital uh, initiative in place because it spoke and connected to a lot of our Latino and Latina entrepreneurs. Why don't we work out a capital access program based on transactional history and that type of behavior with no credit score? So, and then the repayment is based on commerce. What a great idea. So now what we're doing at, at, at uh, LBAN, the Latino Business Action Network, is focusing on cultivating the existing relationships with capital providers whether it be on the debt side, on the equity side with uh, venture, angel, family office financing, innovative crowdsourcing, but now we're looking into FinTech and the PayPal's of the world. Uh, so we need to nurture the now, but we also need to tee these conversations up for the new normal and then whatever post COVID means. So that's what's happening with our Latino Latina entrepreneurs that are involved with LBAN. Well, I, I think it's been incredible um, what you all have done in terms of putting resources, not just out to your cohorts, but to the entire community. Um, and, and I'll look forward to kind of having you go into to more detail as the conversation continues. Um, but I, I think one of the most valuable things for everyone listening, uh, Suzanne, is going to be your story of, of what you went through um, as it relates to PPP. So share, share with us your experience and don't leave out the tweet no matter what. <laughs> yeah, that was a good part of the story. Um, hi, thank you all for having me today. Uh, my name is Suzanne Sitter. I am located in Lighthouse Point, Florida, South Florida area. And um, I have a dance studio for the last 17 years that services kids ages three to 18. And I'm in my community. I live in this community. I work in this community. A lot of these children start at my school when they're three and they grow up. We see them sometimes more often than their own parents do. And um, we had to close down the studio on March 15th. We, we realized that these county schools had closed and um, then the governor's order came out that all the businesses had to close down and that's what we did. And immediately amongst my employees, of course there was panic because they have children, they have to put food on the table, they have rent to pay. I have one teacher that's expecting a new baby in August. And I promised them that no matter, that it, it didn't, I didn't care what I had to do, they were gonna see a paycheck. And I also have a wonderful landlord. I actually really like my landlord a lot. He's a terrific man. And I wanted to do the right thing there. I've never owed anybody any money in my life other than my home mortgage the whole thought of being in this financial place when possibly not being able to pay our bills really had me 
pretty upset. So when the PPP option came out, I knew that that was going to be a good option for us because I knew we would be having class over the next eight weeks virtually. We, we transferred to this Zoom platform and we taught class. We've been teaching class all along. The teachers have been being paid because our students pay their tuition on a monthly basis, much like you would pay a gym. And of course, unfortunately, we did have parents that lost jobs. We did have a drop in our income. We do, if anyone has ever been to dancing school before or have kids that have gone to dancing school, you know that usually there's a dance recital at the end of the year. And the reason really for that dance recital is because we run like a school. So we need to try and figure out a way to pay 12 months of bills with 10 months of income. So that dance recital that we would put on would often cover our summer expenses. But the recital has, right now we say postponed, but we couldn't have ticket sales and that was a significant part of our anticipated income for the year. So I am, I've been a banking customer with Wells Fargo for a very long time. Before that, Wachovia, then Wachovia had bought it over. Before Wachovia, it was First Union. And I heard about the PPP and I thought, well, great, you know, I'll just apply through Wells Fargo. I've been there for a long time. I'm sure this will be no problem. So the application, um, everyone else that I knew got to apply on, I believe it was April 3rd. And then April 4th came and we were given as customers this intake form basically. And then the days kept going by and everyone is putting in their applications for this PPP program. And as a Wells Fargo customer, I'm not getting any sort of application. Um, you couldn't get through. I was on Twitter all the time, searching for information, still no application. And then one day just by accident, I had on CNN and I hear Jake Tapper say, PayPal is now funding the PPP loans or taking the PPP applications, I should say. And so I said, fine, I'll, I'll apply with PayPal. I'm a I'm a PayPal customer for my personal use, um, and I know that they're a trusted name. So I went online, I filled the application out with PayPal. It was the quickest one, it was really simple. I filled it all out. By that afternoon, I received back the documents to sign. The very next day, I got the email from the SBA saying that I had been approved. And the day after that, I woke up and the funds were in my checking account. And I, so that was Tuesday to Thursday. I applied Tuesday and Thursday I was funded. And I kept checking my checking account all day on Thursday thinking, this, this has to be a mistake because everybody that I know, all my friends that I was so jealous of that put their applications in, you know, on April 3rd and 4th, they're still waiting and I have this, these funds already. And what it just, it enabled me to just relax and get my bearings and plan out the next few months, which was critical because when you have employees, and most importantly, when you have all these children who are looking to you as something in their life that is, you know, a sense of normalcy and stability. And I promised all these people that we would keep going. And so what it did was enabled us, at least for the time being, to keep going. We hope we, hope we can resume classes soon. Um, here in Florida, we're starting to open back up again, of course, taking all the necessary precautions. But um thanks to paypal and and the tweet part which was really great <laughs> was i felt this obligation because i was on twitter searching for information all the time there were so many people that just weren't getting anywhere trying to fill out an application and get it accepted and so i had been reading tweets from my congressman and marco rubio had been working really closely trying working on this ppp and I felt the need to tell everybody about PayPal because it was Jake Tapper that was on his uh, show that I heard about PayPal. And so I tweeted out that Jake Tapper saved my dancing school for mention. I thanked him for mentioning it on the air. And I believe I even got messages from that tweet for people that read the tweet and applied through PayPal were funded. I also belong to a Facebook group of about five, almost 5,000 dance studio owners across the country. And we're all great artists, but business things sometimes are a little elusive. And the PayPal, I guarantee every uh, application PayPal got from a dance studio came from that Facebook group, from that one Facebook status. So um, it's been 
it's, uh, I'm really, really grateful. I don't know what I would have done without this PPP money and without, above all, how quickly uh, PayPal <laughs> was able to fund, have it funded, help us get it funded. Well, and, and Suzanne, we've taken a little moderator's uh, privilege to track down that tweet, <laughs> including Jake's reply and, and thrown it up on the screen. And I think that's an incredible story. Um, and I think it's uh, an incredible testament to some of the private sector solutions. And so I wanna open it up um, to, to everyone and, and get the conversation going. Um, and and let's, let's start right there of um, what role, is are folks seeing the private sector play? What role for alternative lending? Karen, I know you you were one of the drivers in the Jobs Act of uh, crowdfunding years ago in in our last recession. So, you know, we've talked a lot about these federal PPP and IDLE and things like that. What else are you all seeing out there that small business owners should be aware of? Well. You know, I'll start since um, you, you you mentioned crowdfunding and and I love Suzanne's story and it is why, uh, as you know, um, John, why we were so adamant about getting fintech in from the very beginning, um, so that um, you know all small businesses that needed the money, you know, would be able to um, access these loans. And we know between all the fintechs that they have millions of customers between them. They have the speed, the power, the AI uh, to do this very quickly. And um, and so, so then your story is just terrific. And it's just, it makes me, it's hard, I was just heartened to hear that we put so much work into getting FinTech in. They got in, you know, at the end of the first tranche, but I think they're making a big difference in the second tranche. Um, yes, in terms of crowdfunding, um, you know, it's really neat to see the, um, uh, some of the regulatory agencies doing what they can to respond to COVID-19. And so recently the Securities and Exchange Commission um, put forward temporary conditional rules that will make it easier and less costly for um, established small businesses to raise up to $250,000 on, on regulated uh, platforms. So, you know, rather than having to go through the time and money of submitting um, uh, uh, financials that are reviewed, they could do, uh, you know, something alternative uh, to that. Um, they could actually test the waters and see if there's interest, you know, in um, their network um, and, and, and any network that might be uh, investors that might be a part of a regulated platform uh, to fund uh, their, their businesses. They could get obviously their customers involved, their family involved, their friends involved, their whole social network, they'll get that money more quickly, um, which is really good. So they've compressed, you know, the time frame for which small businesses and, and taken a lot and provided relief in allowing them to launch crowdfunding campaigns much more quickly and get the money much more quickly. So this is really great. And if you go to our website, sbecouncil.org, we do have a webinar on this tomorrow in terms of how to take advantage of this crowdfunding window, but we also have the latest data on crowdfunding. For, now this is the four, four years of crowdfunding is under our belt. And, um, you know, 1,700 um, businesses have been uh, funded, uh, $373 million has been um, raised from both accredited and non-accredited investors using crowdfunding. 80% are actually retail investors or non-accredited investors. And there's just a lot of good news on this front. And let me just add one more thing. Before the SEC put out this uh, special rule uh, to provide relief um, in response to COVID-19, they've already been going through a rulemaking process, a harmonization, sort of fixing crowdfunding a little bit to leverage all the success that we've seen. So. You know, you can raise up to five million. It was only one million before, and there's other rule changes that make it um, easier, less costly, um, and more appealing uh, for businesses to um, do an equity or debt-based raise. So, again, tomorrow we have a webinar at one o'clock. Please join us if you'd like to. But I see this um, really taking off in the future, particularly when we get these final. Uh, uh, rules coming through the SEC that are, is really going to make it a lot easier for small businesses to use this. And 
look at zero fraud. There's been zero, zero fraud. 60% of the businesses that raise money are success, that do a crowdfunding campaign are successful. You know, with venture capital, only 2% of small businesses actually, you know, are successful in raising money. You're talking 60%. Women minorities are much more successful. So a lot of good news. Visit us, sbecouncil.org. We have all this information posted. I can't, uh, thanks, Karen. I can't stress that enough. What you have here, in addition to Suzanne's incredible story, are three organizations that are um, at the top of their class in terms of being resources. Um, and they provide those on their websites. They have their own webinars. And so if you have questions about the specifics, Karen made a good example of, of um, crowdfunding. And, uh, um, you know, those are the kinds of resources you get from these kinds of organizations. So please um, check them out, participate, um, belong. That these, are, these are the right things that small business owners need. Um, Todd or Mark, giving, give you an opportunity of the, the role of anything in the private sector, from fintechs to lending institutions to, are you seeing any other solutions unrelated to federal programs that have been helpful to your constituencies? Well, I'll, I'll chime in here. Um, it's nice to see the, the private sector and high net worth individuals, Matt Johnson, stepping up to the plate. We need more of that. You know, small business is the heartbeat of our economy. So I hope this is a, uh, just a start of a new momentum when it comes to high net worth individuals coming in and being a part of the game. You know, uh, if we could have a balance of altruism and self-interest, I think that's the capitalist way. So we need to open up those doors of opportunity. It's going to be absolutely essential. And I also want to touch up on the uh, Fed's uh, Main Street Lending Facility as well, just as a byproduct. Um, you know, I asked one of my dear friends at the Fed, I said, okay, so the, the marketing language is out there, but when is it going to be available? And so we already have the breaking news on those two webinars scheduled for late May on the how. Uh, the other thing is, is that we're really interested in the concept of let's be architects of our own solutions. And so I see a lot of JVs, joint ventures happening with our alumni group. We have a mantra, do business with each other and get business for each other. So we are very interested in that concept, building marketplaces and aligning uh, interested parties within the network so that they can present uh, capital opportunities uh, to investors. So. I just wanted to highlight those uh, three initiatives. Yeah, I just had just a couple of things, John. One is getting into what Mark was just saying. Uh, there are so many collaborations happening among companies, and I think the ones that are the companies that are going to grow the fastest and do the best coming out of this are those that have that have kept really strong networks and kept in touch with them, and collaborated in creative ways to rethink their companies and rethink their futures uh, in conjunction with other potentially what seemed like unrelated companies. And I, there's just so many exciting things going on out there that I'd really encourage people if they, if they haven't sort of reached out to collaborate with their networks of other business owners, they should, they should, they should spend some time doing that. It may not feel like the right way to spend your time, but I think it, it, it may be. The other really bright spot I think is, is there's been so much innovation and great thinking from the fintech world of the last few years. But when you look at the actual numbers of, of in terms of the share of lending that, that fintech has been able to grab in the small business marketplace, it's still been relatively small. But I do think fintech has done such a great job for the most part with the PPP. I think it may give them the real opportunity to step up the small business market in a way that we have to a greater degree than we've seen so far and force innovation and and uh, more of a small business focus on the larger institutions the more the more entrenched incumbent players in the marketplace so i think it could could really lend really good long-term benefits as well to the, to, to the credit markets for small companies suzanne um you know and i think you touched on so many things that business owners must be doing you successfully uh pursued um the the eligibility through ppp and i i commend your your dogged approach of finding a solution that works um i think second uh you've shared that with others and you've found peer networking groups that that facebook group is is incredible and and to todd's point collaborations right now are there other things that you've gone virtual um which so many of us have have had to do um 
Are there other things that you would recommend to other business owners before we open it up to a broader conversation that have helped you as a business owner get through a very challenging time? Um, yes, I, I must. I must, I feel obligated to give a shout out to my local governmental representatives. They've been incredibly helpful. And I think my state representative, Chip Lamarca, he's helped me tremendously throughout all of this as has his aides in his office. For some reason, people forget about what the, their purpose is. And they are really often quite willing to be helpful if you just reach out to them. And I think people forget about that. And they've never, I mean, even when they didn't have the answers, they looked for the answers for me. And I really, I know we are in this age now where if someone's in politics, they get slammed all the time. And I've seen that our local government has really come through in spades for the small businesses in my community. They really do everything they possibly can to be helpful. And when they, they gather um, information for us, even when it comes to now these phased reopenings and things, they've been super responsive. And I've seen so many really shine during this time. And I, I'd like small business owners not to forget about them. You're not an island. You know, there are there are people in your own. I know this sounds like such an unusual thing to say, but your government really does want to help you sometimes. And so you just have to ask for the help. And they've been they've been terrific. I'm really grateful to them. Well, as as you all know, um, I have about two dozen more questions I'd like to ask um, this impressive group. But I want to be fair to the um, 300 plus folks who have joined us today and and bring in some of their questions. Please do ask your questions in the chat box. Um, in the remaining time we have, we'll um, get as many as we can. I'd like to tap back in um, Paul Dissel Cohen uh, from PayPal. Paul, if you could join us for questions, because a few of them, um, I think some folks were inspired by Suzanne's story and uh, have a couple questions. And the first is, Paul, set us straight. Are you still taking applications? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, and you know, we've actually seen um, the rate of applications really slow down uh, in the last uh, in the last week or so. And you know, we're yeah, I know that that Karen talked about this a little bit earlier, but you know I think that the 75-25 split is a big part of that. Um, you know we're actively in discussions um, with the the House and the Senate on some of the fixes that can be made to resolve that. But um, yes, we we are definitely still uh, taking those applications, and um, you know I, I'm I'm a little biased, but uh, I I think our our team that has been working on this program. Um, has just been tremendous and really working uh, with individual business owners um, to help them through the process um, in case there are any questions, in case there is any complications. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, if, if there's anybody that has not yet uh, gotten a, a PPP application through, um, definitely encourage you to, to check us out. And I, I just see so many positive comments and questions about folks' own experiences uh, with your platform um, that are that are just really positive. Uh, Suzanne, I think a lot of people are both inspired and echo your story um, of, of both the frustration, but then the perseverance. Um, great question that that just popped in. That Mark, I'll kick to you first. Um, are are you seeing any local, state, or federal um, initiatives that are specifically targeting women-owned or minority-owned um, businesses? Are we seeing initiatives that are segmenting? Um, and have you seen those cross your radar? It's not happening as much as we would like, to be honest with you. Uh, so I do uh, commend the municipal uh, actions that are going on. You know, I'm the former CEO of the Greater Austin Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, so I applaud the efforts in Austin, Texas, and other areas of the country. Uh, that's our next layer. You know, we're, we are fighting for transparency, uh, where these dollars are going, you know, chasing the dollars in terms of where they're going to our underserved communities, to our women business owners. So we'd like to see more. I have not come across any segmented layering of, of, of funding, but as soon as we hear about it, we need to elevate the, uh, these programs as bright spots, uh, mm -hmm. scorecard style. So if you have some, please let me know and I will do that. My email is mark at lban.us. Let me know about those bright spots, please. 
Karen or Todd, um, minority owned or women owned businesses or veteran owned for that matter, um, any any thoughts to those specific uh, segments of the community that you think could be helpful? You know, they're, programmatically, no. One thing we've really been encouraging larger companies to do that have diversity programs where they where they ha where they actually cultivate a lot of companies that are minority women uh, 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 veteran owned companies is to to really step up the way they treat those companies. Uh, I mean, I mean, if if they're if they're paying uh, paying them in. 30 or 60 days, they ought to pay them in 15 days or even immediately upon receipt of the, of, of the invoice. That could tremendously help companies right now and disproportionately, I think, help some of those disadvantaged companies that you're talking to. So we've been encouraging that. I, we're, we're hoping some bigger companies can step up and start doing that. And I will only say, um, you know, with respect to the federal programs, you know, if we could go back there, um, as you know, um, you know, John, in that sort of last round of, of, of legislation in terms of the, you know, direction that uh, the SBA was given, because there was, you know, that one major, you know, that one important provision in terms of where the money should be directed, underserved, rural, minority, you know, women-owned businesses. And it, it was something that the uh, IG, the Inspector General at the SBA, you know, dinged, um, uh, that program in terms of where it felt short, along with the 7525 rule. So I think now in terms of, again, I'm looking at the data and the numbers um, at that last uh, PPP report, and it does seem to be, it, there does seem to be a concentrated effort. I mean, we don't have d demographic data, but I think in terms of the increase in the lenders, you know, that reach these communities, you've seen that volume going up. And I think that's good news. Um, but but I agree. There's certainly more that needs to be done, you know, in terms of, you know, addressing the capital needs of women and minority-owned um, businesses. I'm really hoping, again, that when a lot of these changes go through, you know, the big changes with crowdfunding, and maybe we could get some really good examples, you know, with this a temporary relief that's been given, that you know, the communities themselves, the altruistic big investors, uh, you know, as as Mark said you know, will really step up and and fund some of these businesses, you know, to you know, not only help them survive, but then put them in a position where they really can thrive, you know, after after the crisis. So that's why we're doing a lot of outreach to the uh, during this period about the special rules, not only to small businesses along, you know, the platforms, the next seeds, I mean, the, you know, the really established platforms to do these crowdfunding campaigns, but also to big investors as well to say look at some of these um, look at some of these uh, potential companies on these platforms and invest in these businesses and there are certain platforms that do um, that are you know address, that are you know women owned businesses or they do local businesses with minority and again these are crowdfunding is women and minority owned businesses have done really well you know in the crowdfunding space we just want more of them to do really well, you know, during this period that we have the time to make a difference uh, with this relief and hopefully it's relief that we can make permanent um, and that will help a lot of businesses moving forward. I want to, I, I think both you and Todd made really good points on uh, the role of major corporations and, you know, if you're a small business, Many small businesses, their biggest customer is a big business. And um, if that's your case, I do encourage you to reach out to that large company. So many of them um, are, are listing out, creating their own um, programs for their suppliers. And so if you haven't checked out your own vendors, supplier plans, and, and Todd makes the great point that diversity is really important there, um, you know, please, please do check those out. And again, just more resources um, and I saw a lot of questions about webinars that Mark and Karen um, and Todd have mentioned. Um, visit visit their websites uh, for times uh, and to register and um, to know what time zone they're in. We're getting a, a few around that. Um, I do, uh, I do um, Paul, I'm gonna tag you back in just for a couple clarifications. Um, do folks need to be working capital uh, customers in order to take advantage of the um, application? 
No, um, uh, not only do they not have to be working capital customers, um, they don't even have to be PayPal customers. Um, we actually saw um, early on in, in our funding, um, I, I don't have the exact figures, but um, you know, somewhere around 10% uh, of our applications and our funds um, were going to um, non-PayPal customers. Um, so uh, it, it is open to anyone. I really uh, appreciate appreciate that, and and a lot of questions about um, it, you know are women owned and minority owned and all types of businesses able to apply, and and the answer is absolutely yes. And I think PayPal should be commended for um, some of the work they've done. Um, it's the small loans that we've seen typically need to go through a fintech platform, and um, a lot of times that's helping out in in all sorts of communities. Um, I want to pivot a little bit from short term uh, if, to get uh, all five of your views, quite frankly, um, and this this may be a good uh, closing point, um, is where where do we go from here over the long term? What are one or two keys um, that you see, whether, Paul, it's, you know, what role do you see fintechs having over the long term uh, or any of the panelists? What role is small business going to play in getting America and the world, uh, more respectively, back on its feet? Well, I'll just say I think small businesses are going to play the central role in getting small business back on its feet because we're a fundamentally small business country. And if there is a silver lining to all of this, it is that is that these events and the repercussions we've seen have reminded people of that. And I think it's easy for people to kind of forget they get so focused on some re a few really big companies out there, they forget day in and day out that it is the small business community that drives this country, not just economically, but in all kinds of ways, uh, socially and so forth. Um, so I, for me, the key thing that we have to maintain is that feeling and that realization and that small business has to be at the center of everything that state, local, and federal governments do over the next few months. They've got to for ask first and foremost, how is this helping small companies? How could this be getting in the way of small companies? Um, and, and uh, uh, you know, getting through this is not going to be a silver bullet. There's going to be a whole bunch of things. Um, and if we can make sure that even if we don't have the resources as organizations to be there, that it's in the minds of those policymakers, in the minds of those members of Congress, in the minds of those regulators, when they're developing their plans, how can this be good for small business? We will have gone a long way. I agree with that. And, and you know, it is going to take some time to dig out. I mean, it is going to be small business owners and entrepreneurs. The small business economy plays a huge role, obviously, in job creation and innovation and economic growth moving forward. And, um, you know, I think, I mean, what we're going to be working on a lot is, you know, what can we do to uh, maintain that entrepreneurial spirit and, you know, gives people both the, the risk-taking mojo <laughs> as well as the capital and other resources to start businesses. Because that's going to, there's going to be necessity entrepreneurship and there's going to be opportunity entrepreneurship mm -hmm. that comes out of this. And there's going to be a lot of new needs in the marketplace that emerge uh, that we're going through transformations right now. So I'm very excited about all these opportunities and the new entrepreneurs that are going to come out of this, the new businesses that they're going to build. But we also have to, I and mean, this is the time, I think, you know, for local and state and, and national officials. You know, for a long time, we say we need to embed entrepreneurial education very early on, you know, in the education process. We need to provide these resources to people and connect with them where they are. And I think this is the, an, an opportunity to do that, too, because really, it really took this crisis for a lot of people to understand the importance of the small business economy. And, um, and I think many get it now. So it's an opportunity us, for us to build out this ecosystem and uh, give more people you know, the opportunity to pursue the American dream of entrepreneurship, but to be the capital, the resources, the education, the how-to stuff in order to make that happen. John, I'd like to mention something right quick. Thank you, Karen and Todd, amazing reflections there. Talk to each other, entrepreneurs. You know, With the, the graduates of our scaling program at Standard, which are all scale Latinx firms, we've unleashed the good beast through an alumni portal 
In real-time conversations, we've built a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, support system, a mentorship platform of like-minded individuals. Look at Suzanne's Facebook group. That's exactly what we've done here. Social media. It's time for the voices and the collective voices of entrepreneurs to rise up because I'm telling you something, the legislators will listen. So please continue talking to each other uh, with the PayPal situation. That's how we got, I believe, 10 accepted within a 24-hour pay period saying, I got approval in 24 hours. That message went viral. So we uh, hope that you continue doing that. That's going to be critical. Suzanne, any closing thoughts from our entrepreneur? Well, I, for a lot of us small business owners, especially those of us that live in the same communities that we serve, we're part of the fabric of the community. I know every parent. I've watched their kids graduate. I have now my second generation coming up of the kids that I taught when they were little. Their babies are coming in now to dance in my school. We owe it to each other to be there for each other. I, my community will be there for me, but I also owe it to them to be there for them. We're, we're real central um, meeting places. A lot of the moms will get together and meet up at the dance studio and go um, do stuff together, or the different restaurants in our community. It's, a, it's my community is made up mostly of small businesses. So it's about the humanity for me. It's, it's, it's about being so deeply woven into the very families that I serve. And so that's why I'm not going anywhere. A amen, I, Suzanne. <laughs> yeah, it's and and I think there's 300 other um, Suzannes on the phone, which is just a small sliver of this is how. To Todd's point, this is how we bounce back. Um, Paul, any any closing thoughts from PayPal's perspective? No, you know, I I think that um, I, really for us, uh, I'll just echo what what everybody else has said about you know really looking at. Uh, meeting the small businesses where they need us to be. Uh, when we're looking forward, uh, we're already looking at solutions that can be that gap between, uh, you know, this initial round of um, of help and and a return back to some form of, of normalcy. Um, and you know, I I really liked uh, something that that Mark said earlier uh, so much that I, I wrote it down. Uh, small businesses. In, in this situation really can be the architects of your own solution. Uh, we really want to listen to you guys um, and, and figure out what is the best fit for small businesses right now um, so that we can really help them come back and bring our economy back. Well, and, and I want to say, I wrote down elephants, not hippos, Mark. Um, I, I just want to say what an incredible panel, um, all five of you, thank you for your time today. I know at home, everyone is applauding. I have so many more questions. And so that is why NSBA, Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council, Latino Business Action Network, PayPal, Suzanne, Real Dance Studio, we won't send, we won't bombard everyone with your email. Um, I, you, you've been listening to Small Business Roundtable uh, and to PayPal uh, conversation around um, capital access. We have upcoming webinars along these lines around digital strategy, the role of leadership, um, and of course, supporting uh, diversity, which we had some questions on. So please be joining these, be joining um, the, the webinars that uh, everyone on this call has talked about. You can find everyone here on social media, on their websites. Please stay in touch. Um, and thank you again to our incredible panel and to all of you for joining us here today. This concludes our webinar for today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.